I'm here today with the NetGuardian 224A. This is an SNMP RTU that fits in a standard 19 or 23 inch rack. It is one rack unit in height and it has a couple specialized functions I want to show you. So let's take a look at the front and back panel and I'll walk you through everything. So we start off with a USB craft port. This gives you access to a terminal interface, which you may not actually need at this point. Every modern DPS RTU will have a full web interface. You can configure it that way. And for your first login, you'll just connect to the default IP and then you can change it to any IP you want. So this really used to have more of a purpose, but I still use it pretty regularly for advanced debug. I had a client recently where we were working on a satellite link and that involves some latency as satellites will. It takes a good second to get all the way up to space and back just with the speed of light being what it is. So we looked at the debug because we were initially getting some problems. We confirmed that the problem was related to the delay. We were able to make a few changes and we got everything working. So this is great if you have some unusual scenarios, you can get in there with TerraTerm or HyperTerminal and access that text interface to do, to do some debug and other config. Then we have some LEDs on the front panel. These will tell you if you have a new alarm, if an analog sensor has a threshold alarm, if your control relays are operating. These will go solid if something's happened and you've acknowledged it. They first start blinking, and then if you, you tap the act button if you're out at the site, the blinking will stop, it'll stay lit so you know you still have something active, but you're telling the device, I got it. This way, if something changes again, it can start blinking again and you'll be able to notice, oh, that's something new. We put the tech support phone number front and center, so if you ever have any problems, it's free to call, and they're here right down the hall from me, so it's a good group to get in contact with if you have any trouble. Then we have a temperature sensor. This is on board, and this is actually internally wired to be the first in a daisy chain that involves these other ports. So you can hook up to 16 sensors off of each of these ports with a device maximum of up to 32, and your temp counts as one. So you can technically have up to 31 other sensors here. Very few people use that many. It's usually about a half dozen or so out of the site, but it's available. And with the four ports, each one has its own set of power and it's gonna power all the sensors via the bus. So this would allow you to send some a couple hundred feet in one direction and maybe another a couple hundred feet in another direction and still have enough power to power the whole string. I do have some of the D-wire sensors here I can show you. This is one example, it's temperature and airflow. So this counts as two of your sensors, it's just in one box. And the two things it uses to measure is this little tongue here is flexible and it's connected to a piezoelectric circuit. So that's going to convert the motion to electricity and it can pick that up and tell you just how much air is flowing over that. And then of course it's vented in the sides. So there's a temp sensor on the board inside and you'll just connect a RJ12 right there and it goes back to the unit. And then from here, you have an out port as well. So it's gonna come in one side and then it daisy chains to the next one and the next one and the next one. So you can have a lot of sensors on a string. It's a handy way. You don't have to home run everything back to the box. So that's a good tool to have. There's a couple other types of sensors that we'll make. We do a vibration. So if you wanna put this on your generator, that can be a nice way to say, is it running? Most generators also have an output and I recommend you use that. This is an acid test just to say, if all else fails, no matter what it's telling me, is it vibrating? Because if it's not vibrating, it probably isn't running. And this could be true for other kinds of devices too. If they vibrate, you can put a vibration sensor right on the side. We give you a little screw hole. You can engage that however you want. Just make sure you make good contact because the vibration sensor will depend on it. This is a D-wire node for a propane sensor. So if you want to manage your tank levels, you can monitor those remotely. And the propane sensor will be the last element on a string because that is your out port. And then the D-wire port is where you'll connect to previous sensors or back to the base unit, depending on how many you're using. This is an AC fail module. This involves another external sensor, but this is part of the string and you would, it would feed into here. This would allow you to daisy chain that into your string of sensors. And if the power goes out, you're gonna know about it if you have the sensor set up. And the last one I have here is wind speed. And this is good if you have a helicopter only site. I've heard from clients somewhere between $2,000 and $8,000 a helicopter trip. And sometimes you get up there and the wind is too intense, you can't land because it's not safe and you just wasted that money. And that would pay for a unit like this and a bunch of sensors at least once, if not twice. So it's a really good investment to have a sensor like this. You just have an external anemometer that's up on the roof. This is just inside in a protected area and it's gonna digitize the reading from that anemometer and send it back. And that's actually true for all of these sensors. They're going to digitize at the box so you don't have to have analog voltage degrading all the way back to the device. So you get better accuracy that way. All right, so back to the NetGuardian 224A. 
We've finished the front panel. Let's take a look at the back. So we start off, we have a grounding lug to tie it into your grounding system. This one has a single power input. A lot of our remotes will have dual, but if you don't need that, you can just order it with singles. So the power connects here. We would include the little plug that goes in there. You just connect your wires to it. This is a GMT fuse, and if you're not familiar with these, they just pull right out. They're a little weird looking, but uh, they just click in here to the slot, and that'll protect the device, and you get a couple of spares in your kit when you order it. So if you ever need any more fuses, you'll have them. This is a little interesting. This is a different connector than we'll normally use, but we did it for a particular reason. I showed you the D-wire sensors over here, and those are great because they're bus powered, but any third-party analog sensors you may have for any kind of level or gas detection, anything that, that we don't have a D-wire sensor for, you're going to have to power that almost always. So these we use these two RJ ports, these are RJ45, to support analog readings, but also to send power out. So we're going to power the sensor, and give you take back the reading back from it in one convenient cable. So RJ45 and CAT5 type cable, very convenient for a lot of different uses. And we got a little bit creative with here. We give you the pinout right on the silk screen so there's no confusion when you're wiring it up. And then this is a more familiar connector. This is our 50 pin Amphenol. And this picks up discrete inputs one through 24. Of special note, this is pretty unusual, but there are several types of circuits you can use for monitoring discretes. TTL is one, and this is less common. Usually we'll do dry contacts. So just be sure you understand how electrically you want this thing to be taking in inputs and you order the correct input format, whether it's TTL or our standard dry contacts. You have two relays on this, uh, this device, and this will give you th three pins per relay, and you can wire it either between common and normally closed or common and normally open for each of the two. So three pins and three pins is two control relays. You have a serial port for reaching into an external serial device. So if you've got some legacy equipment that only uses serial and you can't hit it over LAN, now you can because you'll be able to plug in the, this device into the LAN, you hit this interface, and it will just render whatever it's getting over the serial port out of the network telnet connection that you'll establish to this device. So that's really great. You don't have to drive out to the site with a laptop that has a serial port and waste a bunch of time. You can just go right over the network. And then finally, this is a 10100 switch. You can use this as a nice protected switch because it's running presumably on your protected battery plant power, unlike maybe a normal switch. And this is just a very durable and rugged device. It's a great way to give land to three other devices and then you use one of the ports to give land to this device itself. And I talked about the rugged power. Back here on the power input, you'll see 18 to 60 volts. So this is what we'd call our wide range build. So you can do 24, you can do 48 and it doesn't really care, it'll take either one. So we always want our devices to be the last ones to fail if you're having some kind of an issue at the site because we want to be able to report alarms to you all the time, as long as we possibly can. So we will give you a nice wide range of voltage. We don't want to fail first, we always want to fail last. So it's always our goal when we're making these devices. So if you have any questions about the NetGuardian 224A or any of its brothers and sisters, there are about 50 different NetGuardian models, please give us a call, 1-800-693-0351. You can also jump on the website and look at some more specs, www.dpstele.com.